on human and people's rights, where it is currently 9.07 a.m. Uh, GMT. Honorable Commissioner, Honorable Solomon Ayele Derso, Chairperson, uh, African Commission on Human and People's Rights. Excellencies, Ministers of State's Parties to the African Charter. Dr. Habele Matlosa, Director of the Department of Political Affairs of the African Union Commission, representing His Excellency Musa Faki Mahamat, Chairperson of the African Union Commission. Honorable Heads of rep and Representatives of Organs of the African Union Honorable Vice Chairperson and Commissioners of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, distinguished delegates of state parties to the African Charter, representatives of national human rights institutions, representatives of international organizations, representatives of non-governmental organizations, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols duly observed. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the closing ceremony of the 67th Ordinary Session of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. My name is Abiola Iduwujo, and I will be the MC for this occasion. May I kindly request your excellencies, participants, and invited guests to assume a solemn posture in observance of the African Union Anthem. Thank you. Thank you very much. In a short while, I will take you through the order of proceedings. But before I do so, excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, kindly permit me to share the following guidelines with you on how to make this virtual meeting on the Zoom platform more effective and as smooth flowing as possible. Firstly, may I kindly request all distinguished panelists to ensure that their microphones are muted and that they remain muted throughout the proceedings unless the floor has been yielded to you. To access the language interpretation services, kindly select your desired language from the menu at the bottom of your Zoom screen. The available languages are English, French, Portuguese, and Arabic. When you speak, kindly ensure that your channel is set to the language in which you're speaking in order to avoid channel overlap with interpretation. As there is often a time lag between the sound transmission of the language of the speaker and the interpretation, kindly be patient. Please bear with unavoidable delays in interpretation. And should you encounter any challenges with respect to interpretation, please use the chat link to communicate this to us. The IT team uh, will immediately assist you to reconnect you to the proceedings. Should you be disconnected from the proceedings, kindly contact the IT host Etwell Karikoga for assistance. You may contact him through the private chat link. Please ensure that multiple devices connected to these proceedings are not active in the same room at the same time as this may, may cause equal and other disturbances. Finally, kindly accept our apologies in advance and bear with us for any technical challenges that we may have overlooked as we strive to improve our delivery to our stakeholders or challenges which are beyond our control. I will now present the order of proceedings for the closing ceremony, which will be as follows. First, we will have the reading of the final communique by Honorable Commissioner Mary Louise Abomo. This will be followed by the statement of the Chairperson of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, Honorable Solomon Ayele Derso. After that, Dr. Habele Matlosa, Director of the Department of Political Affairs of the African Union Commission, will deliver the closing statement on behalf of His Excellency Musa Faki Mahamat, Chairperson of the African Union Commission, and declare the 67th Ordinary Session of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights closed. 
That will bring us to the end of the closing ceremony. I now call upon Honorable Commissioner Mary Louise Abomo to read the final communique of the 67th Ordinary Session of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. Honorable Commissioner, you have the floor, ma'am. Merci de me passer la parole, Madame Abiola, pour la lecture du communiqué final sanctionnant cette 67e session ordinaire. Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs les représentants des États, Mesdames et Messieurs les commissaires, chers collègues, Mesdames et Messieurs les représentants des INDH, Mesdames et Messieurs les représentants des organisations de la société civile, distingués participants, je vous présente mes respects. Voici à présent la teneur du communiqué final de la présente session qui s'achève aujourd'hui. La Commission africaine des droits de l'homme et des peuples a tenu sa 67e session ordinaire virtuellement du 13 novembre au 3 décembre 2020 du fait de la persistance de la pandémie de la COVID-19. Son Excellence Sarah Agnan Agbor, commissaire aux ressources humaines, à la science et à la technologie au sein de la Commission de l'Union africaine, représentant son Excellence Moussa Faki Mahamat, président de la Commission africaine, la Commission de l'Union africaine, a honoré de sa présence la cérémonie d'ouverture et déclaré la session ouverte. Les travaux de la session ont été présidés par l'honorable commissaire Solomon Ayele Derso, président de la Commission, assisté de l'honorable commissaire Rémi Ngoy Lumbu, vice-président de la Commission. Les membres ci-après de la Commission ont participé à la session. L'honorable commissaire Solomon Ayele Derso, le président, l'honorable commissaire Rémi Ngoy Lumbu, le vice-président, l'honorable commissaire Maya Salif Fadel, l'honorable commissaire Jamsina Issy El King, l'honorable commissaire Atem Haïsem, l'honorable commissaire Maria Teresa Manuela, l'honorable commissaire Alexia Ames Bury, l'honorable commissaire Moutfo Zakaria Mwandenga, l'honorable commissaire Marie-Louise Abomo, l'honorable commissaire Ndiame Gay, l'honorable commissaire Kaïté Siza et Nabou Sylvie n'a pas pu part à toute la session et s'est excusé. Madame Anna Foster, directeur du Centre africain pour la démocratie et les études des droits de l'homme, s'exprimant au nom du comité directeur du Forum des organisations non gouvernementales, a indiqué qu'en dépit de la lutte actuelle pour résoudre le problème de la COVID-19, l'Afrique reste confrontée à de nombreuses violations des droits de l'homme et elle a cité une série de dites violations enregistrées récemment dans certains États partis. Elle a également déploré le fait que l'appel de l'Union africaine à faire taire les armes à feu d'ici 2020 ainsi que celui de l'ONU à un cessez le feu n'ont pas encore été suivis des faits en Afrique. Elle a souligné le rôle actif joué par les organisations de la société civile et les médias en tant que partenaires viables et vitaux dans une société démocratique. En abordant la question de la COVID-19, elle a demandé aux États d'impliquer les acteurs non étatiques, en particulier la société civile, dans toutes les actions menées au niveau communautaire, national et régional. Elle a rappelé la nécessité de créer des alliances et des plateformes inclusives entre l'État, la société civile et le secteur privé pour renforcer la solidarité et les mécanismes de soutien, conditions du progrès. Madame Foster a en outre noté que l'adoption d'une approche inclusive pour l'engagement est cruciale pour le succès et conduira sans aucun doute à une meilleure promotion et protection des droits de l'homme en Afrique. Elle a réitéré l'engagement de la société civile à soutenir le travail de la Commission et à inviter les organisations qui ne l'ont pas encore fait à solliciter le statut d'observateur afin de jouer pleinement leur rôle et bénéficier de l'accès à la Commission que ce statut leur accorde. Elle a enfin appelé toutes les parties prenantes à s'engager à nouveau et à redoubler d'efforts pour soutenir et renforcer la Commission et pour la sauvegarde de son indépendance. S'exprimant au nom du réseau des institutions nationales africaines des droits de l'homme, le RINAD, le docteur Elasto Ilarios Mugwadi, 
vice-président du RINAD et président de la Commission nationale des droits humains du Zimbabwe, a souligné le lancement officiel du Forum des institutions nationales des droits de l'homme, qui se tiendra en prélude des sessions ordinaires de la Commission pour échanger sur la situation des droits de l'homme en Afrique en vue de définir une position consolidée sur la voie à suivre pour promouvoir et protéger les droits de l'homme. Elle a, il a également fait le point sur les questions examinées au cours du forum des INDH, tenu virtuellement du 10 au 12 novembre 2020. Le docteur Elasto Hilarius Mugwadi a exprimé la préoccupation du RINAD concernant les nombreuses allégations de violation des droits de l'homme dans les pays africains où des élections ont eu lieu récemment et a rappelé que la puissance d'une nation ne se mesure pas à l'ordre de son agression contre son peuple mais à l'utilisation de ses ressources pour assurer la sécurité et l'avenir de ses contribuables et pour garantir le règne de l'État de droit pour une bonne gouvernance par le biais d'institutions indépendantes. Il a en outre exprimé les préoccupations du RINAD concernant le conflit armé qui perdure, notamment dans la région du Sahel, au Cameroun, en République centrafricaine, au Mozambique, dans certaines parties de la République démocratique du Congo et en Éthiopie. Il a conclu son allocution en demandant aux États partis d'associer tous les acteurs nationaux et internationaux à la planification et à la mise en œuvre des plans de relance socio-économique suite à la crise de la COVID-19 et de donner la priorité à des contributions financières et techniques inclusives pour le développement durable de l'Afrique. Son Excellence, Madame Michelle Bachelet, la haute commissaire des Nations Unies aux droits de l'homme, a reconnu le fait que l'Afrique s'en est mieux sortie que d'autres régions en termes de préjudice sanitaire direct causé par la COVID-19. Elle a cependant fait observer que d'autres aspects de la pandémie frappent très durement le continent et pourraient exacerber les tensions et les conflits, ainsi que leur impact sur le développement des pays. Elle a souligné que des mesures ont été prises par le Bureau du Haut Commissariat des Nations Unies aux droits de l'homme pour aider les gouvernements et d'autres acteurs à atténuer les effets de la COVID-19, tout en reconnaissant que des mesures importantes ont été prises par de nombreux gouvernements. Pour faire respecter les droits des personnes, elle a déploré certaines pratiques dangereuses et négatives occasionnant des violations des droits de l'homme dans le cadre de l'application des mesures d'urgence dans certains pays. Elle a, à ce propos, appelé toutes les parties prenantes à repousser ces tendances négatives qui, à la fois, fragilisent les droits des personnes et nuisent à toute relance éventuelle après la pandémie, et à veiller à ce que la réponse à la COVID-19 et les mesures de relance contribuent à un redressement à long terme, notamment en réduisant les inégalités et la discrimination. Elle a également exprimé ses préoccupations concernant le climat de violence, les tensions intercommunautaires et les restrictions des droits fondamentaux qui ont caractérisé la plupart des récentes élections sur le continent africain. Elle a invité au renforcement des efforts communs pour promouvoir le respect le plus large possible de l'espace civique et démocratique. L'honorable Lady Justice Maria Mapani Kawimbe rapporteur adjoint du comité d'experts africains sur les droits de l'enfant, a indiqué que les questions irrelatives peuvent être résolues au niveau du continent grâce à la collaboration renforcée entre le comité et la commission. Elle a informé le public que l'année 2020 marque le 30e anniversaire de la Charte africaine des droits et du bien-être de l'enfant et que lors de sa commémoration, le comité s'efforce d'évaluer l'état de la mise en œuvre de cet instrument par le biais de diverses activités et études en vue d'accentuer les priorités pour les années à venir. L'honorable Mapani Kawimbe a relevé les divers progrès réalisés dans la protection des droits de l'enfant sur le continent, ainsi que les domaines qui nécessitent plus d'efforts et de collaboration avec les différentes parties prenantes. Elle a souligné que la pandémie de la COVID-19 a exacerbé la maltraitance et la négligence des enfants, si bien que son impact et les diverses mesures prises pour prévenir la propagation du virus ont été et sont encore plus préjudiciables aux enfants 
qu'à toute autre catégorie de la population. Elle a indiqué que le comité a élaboré des notes d'orientation à l'intention des États sur les mesures à prendre pour atténuer l'impact négatif de la pandémie sur les enfants et pour veiller à ce que toutes les mesures prises par les États leur soient adaptées. Elle a enfin rappelé que c'est par l'engagement et une collaboration plus étroite avec toutes les parties prenantes que le sort des enfants africains peut changer en abordant les questions transversales auxquelles ils sont confrontés. Dans son intervention, l'honorable juge Sylvain Auré, président de la Cour africaine de droits de l'homme et des peuples, a relevé qu'en raison de la persistance de la pandémie de la COVID-19, le déficit humanitaire est bien palpable et les droits de l'homme sont mis à rude épreuve. Face à ces nombreux, ces nombreux défis, le rôle des organes ou institutions de promotion et de protection des droits de l'homme et des peuples est plus que crucial. Il a à cet égard souligné que la coopération et la collaboration étroite entre les États, les organes de l'Union africaine ayant un mandat en droit de l'homme, les organisations non gouvernementales et les institutions nationales des droits de l'homme sont un impératif auquel nul ne peut prétendre se soustraire, car l'efficacité des stratégies et des moyens à mettre en œuvre sont aussi à ce prix. Il a rappelé qu'individuellement ou collectivement, la Cour et la Commission sont appelés à œuvrer ensemble pour la même cause, celle du respect et de la protection des droits de l'homme et des peuples. Il a à cet effet invité les deux organes à tout mettre en œuvre pour consolider et rendre plus agissant leur rapport de complémentarité. Le président de la Cour a par ailleurs fait observer que la mission des organes de droits de l'homme ne saurait se limiter au fait de constater des violations des droits de l'homme, de dire le droit, de formuler des recommandations ou d'ordonner des réparations, car les procédures devant les dix organes n'auront d'intérêt pour les peuples africains que si leurs arrêts, ordonnances et recommandations trouvent leur pleine exécution. Il a ainsi appelé à la coopération de toutes les parties prenantes, au premier rang desquelles les États partis, pour faire progresser de façon significative les droits de l'homme et, et les droits des peuples en Afrique. Dans sa déclaration, au nom des États membres de l'Union africaine, l'honorable Daouda Djalou, Attorney General et ministre de la Justice de la République de Gambie, a d'abord insisté sur l'importance des sessions de la Commission. Il a évoqué la situation de la COVID-19 dans son pays et a souligné les mesures prises en vue de prévenir, contenir et gérer la propagation du virus, ainsi que les développements positifs enregistrés dans le domaine de la promotion et de la protection des droits de l'homme. L'honorable Daouda Chalo a noté que notre continent continue à progresser et à se développer régulièrement dans la promotion et la protection des droits de l'homme, mais a toutefois relevé des défis persistants auxquels les États partis restent confrontés. Il a par conséquent invité les États à rester vigilants et à être ouverts à des idées nouvelles et innovantes pour relever ces défis émergents. Il a en outre rappelé que ce n'est qu'en travaillant de concert dans le but ultime de sortir les peuples africains de la pauvreté et de reconnaître leurs droits inaliénables à la liberté, à la justice et à la quête du bonheur, que les dirigeants africains deviendront réellement fiers d'avoir servi le continent. Rappelons l'engagement pris sous le thème, je cite, « faire taire les armes à feu d'ici 2020 », fin de citation, qui est notamment d'éradiquer toutes les guerres, les conflits civils, les conflits violents, la violence sexuelle et sexiste, et pour et prévenir les génocides, il a invité les États à être conscients de leur responsabilité de débarrasser du, le continent des guerres et des conflits inutiles. L'honorable Daouda Jallo a conclu en invitant les États partis à prendre très au sérieux leurs obligations en matière de soumission de rapports périodiques, à faire suite aux décisions et recommandations de la Commission, à renforcer cette dernière, à lui apporter tout le soutien dont elle a besoin pour remplir son mandat au profit du peuple africain. Dans son discours d'ouverture, le président de la Commission, l'honorable commissaire Solomon Aélé Derso, a souhaité la bienvenue à tous les participants à la 67e session ordinaire. Le président a indiqué que le contexte de la pandémie de COVID-19 a démontré que l'accès à l'Internet est essentiel pour la jouissance de divers droits 
notamment l'accès à l'information, le droit à l'éducation, la liberté d'expression, le droit au travail, la participation à la vie publique. Il a fait observer que son manque ou sa privation conduit à l'exclusivité complète de la justice de ses droits, ainsi que d'autres droits fondamentaux, entraînant ainsi l'aggravation des inégalités. À cet effet, il a invité la communauté des droits de l'homme à faire un plaidoyer pour le droit d'accès à l'Internet. Réitérant la nécessité de mettre en œuvre la résolution 449 de la Commission, l'honorable Derso a déclaré que la survenance de la COVID-19 a rappelé que la santé de chaque personne est intrinsèquement liée à sa santé d'autrui. Ainsi, la protection du droit à la santé et la fourniture des soins sont des enjeux pour chaque membre de la société. Le président a exprimé les préoccupations de la Commission sur la situation des droits de l'homme sur le continent, notamment les violations des droits de l'homme commises par l'unité SARS de la police nigériane, la détérioration de la situation des droits de l'homme et les violences post-électorales en Côte d'Ivoire et en Guinée, les allégations d'intimidation et d'attaques en Tanzanie, la situation d'insécurité et de violences communautaires qui règne actuellement dans diverses parties d'Afrique, la crise sociopolitique et les multiples violations des droits de l'homme dans la région du Tigré en Éthiopie. Il a également fait part de quelques développements positifs enregistrés au niveau du continent. Abordant le thème de l'année de l'Union africaine, l'honorable Derso a rappelé les objectifs de la campagne de l'Union africaine de, je cite, « faire taire les armes en Afrique d'ici 2020 » fin de citation, et a fait le lien avec le programme de défense des droits de l'homme. Il a salué le travail des institutions nationales des droits de l'homme qui ne cessent de montrer l'importance cruciale de leur rôle. Il a en outre, en outre salué le rôle des ONG, des mouvements pour la justice sociale, des défenseurs de droits de l'homme et des journalistes pour leur service, parfois au péril de leur vie ou de leur liberté. Prononçant le discours d'ouverture de la session, au nom de son Excellence Moussa Faki Mahamad, président de la Commission de l'Union africaine, son Excellence Sarah Agnan Agbor, commissaire aux ressources humaines, à la science et à la technologie de la Commission de l'Union africaine, est revenu sur la commémoration de la Journée africaine des droits de l'homme qui a été célébrée le 21 octobre sous le thème, je cite, « Faire taire les armes » et approfondir la culture des droits de l'homme et des peuples, les opportunités et les défis de COVID-19 en Afrique. Fin de citation. Elle a rappelé que la promotion et la protection des droits de l'homme et des peuples sont une responsabilité collective, d'où l'importance de reconnaître les défis auxquels sont confrontés tous les États africains pendant cette période de pandémie de COVID-19 et la détermination collective à réfléchir à la meilleure façon de faire progresser les droits de l'homme sur notre continent. Madame Accord a rappelé que la vision d'une Afrique pacifique, unie et prospère, exposée dans l'agenda 2063, ne peut être réalisée que par une planification saine et des poli politiques et actions axées sur les résultats, ce qui exige une détermination commune. Elle a ainsi saisi l'occasion pour appeler tous les États membres de l'Union africaine à coopérer avec tous les organes des droits de l'homme qu'ils ont mis en place afin de garantir que les droits et la dignité de la personne humaine soient pleinement renforcés sur l'ensemble du continent. Pour conclure, elle a prié la Commission d'explorer la possibilité de publier un ensemble d'orientations qui aideront les États partis à adopter une approche fondée sur les droits de l'homme en réponse à la COVID-19 et à déclarer la session ouverte. Un total de 552 délégués ont participé à la session, soit 89 représentant les États partis de 26 pays, 11 représentant les organes de l'Union africaine, 53 représentant les INDH, 23 des organisations internationales et intergouvernementales, 328 des ONG africaines internationales, 47 d'autres observateurs et un étant issu des médias. Les représentants de sept États partis suivants ont fait des déclarations sur la situation des droits de l'homme dans leurs différents pays, à savoir la République d'Angola, 
la République arabe sahraoui démocratique, la République du Cameroun, la République de Côte d'Ivoire, la République arabe d'Égypte, la République d'Érythrée, la République de Malawi. Les représentants de 14 INDH ont fait des déclarations sur la situation des droits de l'homme dans leur pays, à savoir Afrique du Sud, Burundi, Éthiopie, Kenya, Malawi, Mali, Mauritanie, Nigeria, la RASD, la République démocratique du Congo, le Rwanda, le Sénégal, la Tanzanie et la Zambie. Une organisation internationale, le Comité international de la Croix-Rouge, a fait une déclaration sur la situation des droits de l'homme en Afrique. 27 ONG, jouissant du statut d'observateur auprès de la Commission, ont fait des déclarations sur la situation des droits de l'homme en Afrique. Trois États partis ont exercé leur droit de réponse. Il s'agit de la République de Côte d'Ivoire, de la République arabe d'Égypte et de la République d'Érythrée. La Commission a lancé les documents suivants. L'observation générale numéro 6 sur l'article 7 alinéa D du protocole de Maputo. La version simplifiée des principes sur la dépénalisation des délits mineurs en Afrique. Le bulletin d'information numéro 14 sur la police et les droits de l'homme en Afrique. Le bulletin d'information du groupe de travail sur les industries extractives, l'environnement et les violations des droits de l'homme en Afrique. Dans l'objectif de renforcer la promotion et la protection des droits de l'homme sur le continent, plusieurs panels portant sur différentes thématiques ont été organisés au cours de la session. Il s'agit du panel sur le thème de l'Union africaine pour l'année 2020, « Droits de l'homme et des peuples pour faire taire les armes en Afrique », du panel sur les principes sur la dépénalisation des délits mineurs en Afrique, du panel sur le droit à la santé et son financement, en vue de la création d'un système de santé pour l'accès universel aux soins de santé. Du panel sur la feuille de route d'Addis Abeba, sur les relations entre la Commission et les mécanismes de droits de l'homme et des Nations Unies. Du panel sur la situation des disparitions forcées en Afrique, protection de toutes les personnes contre les disparitions forcées en Afrique du panel sur les industries extractives et les flux financiers illicites en Afrique, du panel sur la question des déplacements forcés et des conflits en Afrique, du panel sur la situation de la liberté d'association en Afrique, du panel sur la situation des droits des personnes âgées et des personnes handicapées en Afrique dans le contexte de la flambée de la pandémie du COVID-19 et plaidoyer pour la ratification du protocole sur les droits des personnes âgées en Afrique et du protocole sur les droits des personnes handicapées en Afrique, du panel sur le rôle des institutions nationales des droits de l'homme dans le travail de la Commission. La Commission a rendu compte de l'état de ses relations et de sa coopération avec les INDH et les ONG. Elle a également fait le point sur la soumission des rapports d'activité par les INDH et les ONG. Conformément à sa résolution sur l'octroi du statut d'affilié aux INDH et aux institutions spécialisées dans la défense des droits de l'homme en Afrique, la Commission a accordé le statut d'affilié à UN, une INDH, UNDH, la Commission nationale des droits de l'homme et de la citoyenneté de Cabo Verde. Cela porte à 30 le nombre total des INDH, les institutions spécialisées, jouissant du statut d'affilié auprès de la Commission. En application de sa résolution sur les critères d'octroi et de maintien du statut d'observateur aux ONG en, mar, en charge des droits de l'homme et des peuples en Afrique, la Commission a accordé le statut d'observateur aux trois ONG suivantes. African Biodiversity Network, Media Council of Tanzania, Mac for Peace, Development and Human Rights. Je vous prie de m'excuser. La Commission a renvoyé l'examen du demande d'octroi du statut d'observateur soumise par l'ONG International Press Institute. 
Cela porte à 528 le nombre total des ONG jouissant du statut d'observateur auprès de la Commission. La Commission a fait le point sur la soumission des rapports périodiques des États partis. Conformément à l'article 62 de la Charte africaine, la Commission a examiné le rapport unique valant quatrième, cinquième et sixième rapports périodiques du Cameroun au titre de la Charte africaine des droits de l'homme et des peuples et premier rapport au titre du protocole à la Charte africaine des droits de l'homme et des peuples relatif aux droits de la femme en Afrique, le protocole de Maputo et de la Convention de l'Union africaine sur la protection de l'assistance aux personnes déplacées en Afrique. Monsieur le Président, avec votre permission, est-ce que le commissaire Atem peut prendre la suite Je vous remercie. <coughs> Sorry, uh, apologies about that. Uh, I hope Commissioner Bomo gets well. Uh, she's having a bit of a problem. Abiola, if you kindly give the floor to Commissioner Hatton, please. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, Honorable Commissioner Hatton, uh, kindly conclude the reading of the final communique. Thank you very much, sir. Vous avez la parole. Which paragraph, please? Paragraph 31. Merci. Bonjour, mesdames, messieurs. Je continue la lecture à la place de l'honorable Marie-Louise. Conformément à l'article 62 de la Charte africaine, la Commission a examiné le rapport unique valant 4e, 5e et 6e rapport périodique du Cameroun au titre de la Charte africaine des droits de l'homme et des peuples et premier rapport au titre du protocole à la Charte africaine des droits de l'homme et des peuples relatifs aux droits de la femme en Afrique, le protocole de Maputo et de la Convention de l'Union africaine sur la protection et l'assistance aux personnes déplacées en Afrique, la Convention de Kampala. Les membres ci-après de la Commission ont présenté le rapport d'intercession pour mettre en lumière les activités entreprises en leur qualité de commissaire, de rapporteur pays et de titulaire de mandat de mécanismes spéciaux. Le président de la Commission qui a rendu compte de ses activités en qualité de président de la Commission et du Bureau, le président du groupe de travail sur les industries extractives, l'environnement et les violations des droits de l'homme en Afrique, le vice-président de la Commission et rapporteur spécial sur les défenseurs des droits de l'homme et point focal sur les représentants en Afrique, la rapporteur spéciale sur les droits de la femme en Afrique, la rapporteure spéciale sur les réfugiés, les demandeurs d'asile, les personnes déplacées et les migrants en Afrique, la rapporteure spéciale sur la liberté d'expression et l'accès à l'information en Afrique, le président du comité pour la prévention de la torture en Afrique, la rapporteure spéciale sur les prisons, les conditions de détention et l'action policière en Afrique, la présidente du groupe de travail sur les populations et communautés autochtones en Afrique, la présidente du comité de protection des droits des personnes vivant avec le VIH SIDA et des personnes à risque vulnérables et affectées par le VIH, le président du groupe de travail sur les droits économiques, sociaux et culturels en Afrique, le président du groupe de travail sur les droits des personnes âgées et des personnes handicapées en Afrique, le président du groupe de travail sur la peine de mort, les exécutions extrajudiciaires, sommaires ou arbitraires et les disparitions forcées en Afrique, et enfin la présidente du groupe de travail sur les communications. La présentation de ces rapports a suscité des réactions, contributions et questions de la part des délégués d'État et des représentants des organisations de la société civile. Au cours de la séance privée, la Commission a examiné et adopté les documents suivants avec des amendements. Le projet de plan stratégique 2021-2025 et le rapport de la mission de promotion effectuée en Afrique du Sud. La Commission a examiné les rapports suivants. Le rapport sur les actions de suivi le rapport de la secrétaire de la Commission, le rapport sur l'audit des communications et le rapport du comité consultatif 
sur les questions budgétaires et du personnel. La commission a examiné 20 communications, soit 14 communications à l'étape de l'examen de la recevabilité, parmi lesquelles 5 communications ont été déclarées recevables, 7 communications examinées conjointement déclarées irrecevables et 2 communications dont l'examen a été renvoyé en raison des contraintes de temps. Une communication qui a fait l'objet d'un désistement, une communication qui a été radiée pour manque de diligence de la part des plaignants, une demande de révision d'irrecevabilité qui a été rejetée et deux communications qui ont fait l'objet d'orientation et une communication qui a été renvoyée. La commission a également identifié les communications en état de rédaction d'une décision sur le fond. Et une dizaine de communications ont fait l'objet d'échanges entre les juristes et les commissaires rapporteurs. Suite à cela, des orientations ont été données en vue de faciliter le processus de rédaction des projets de décision et relatives. La Commission a adopté des résolutions sur les mécanismes spéciaux, des résolutions relatives à des pays et des résolutions thématiques qui seront finalisées et publiées sur le site web de la Commission. La Commission a examiné et adopté ses 48e et 49e rapports d'activité. Le rapport combiné sera ensuite soumis à la 38e session ordinaire du Conseil exécutif de l'Union africaine et à la 36e session ordinaire de la conférence chef d'État et de gouvernement de l'Union africaine prévue se tenir en janvier 2021. La Commission a décidé de tenir virtuellement sa 30e session extraordinaire du 11 au 19 décembre 2020 les informations relatives à sa prochaine session ordinaire seront communiquées en temps opportun sur le site web de la Commission. La Commission exprime sa sincère gratitude aux États partis, aux organisations internationales, aux INDH, aux ONG et aux autres parties prenantes qui ont participé à cette deuxième session ordinaire virtuelle. La cérémonie de clôture de la 67e session ordinaire s'est déroulée virtuellement le 3 décembre 2020. Je vous remercie de votre attention, mesdames et messieurs. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Commissioner Esaim Hatem and Honorable Commissioner Marie Louise Abomo uh, for the collective efforts uh, in delivering the final communique of the 67th Ordinary Session of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. Do feel better, uh, Honorable Commissioner Abomo. Now I have the pleasure to invite the chairperson of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, Honorable Commissioner Solomon Ayele Derso, to deliver his statement. Honorable Chairperson, you have the floor, sir. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. I would like to bring to all of you honorable members of the commission, distinguished delegates, uh, colleagues, the staff of the secretariat and our interpreters. A very good day to all of you. With your kind permission, I would like to stand on existing protocols. Good afternoon and good morning to all of you who have joined us today from across the African continent. I would like to thank you all for joining us on this last day of the 67th Ordinary Session of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. The Ordinary Session of the Commission is a very unique platform in that it brings together and offers a collective platform for exchange on the state of human rights in Africa, for states parties, national human rights institutions, and civil society organizations. I would like to thank all those who participated during this 67th organization of the commission, including the states parties, particularly Algeria, Angola, Burundi, Cameroon, Comoros, Democratic Republic of Congo, Côte d'Ivoire, Egypt, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Gabon, the Gambia, Ghana, Kenya, 
Madagascar, Mauritius, Malawi, Namibia, Rwanda, Senegal, Sierra Leone, South Africa, Tanzania, and Zimbabwe. We wish to in particular thank and express our appreciation to those states who delivered statements during our session. I wish to single out the Republic of Cameroon for presenting its periodic report on its implementation of the African Charter, the Maputo Protocol on the Rights of Women, the Kampala Convention on the Rights of Persons, displaced per, internally displaced persons. We look forward to Cameroon's follow-up to the observations made by the Commission, including on the urgent need for resolving the conflict in the Anglophone regions by addressing the legitimate grievances that create the conditions for the conflict. I would also wish to take this opportunity to call on state parties whose reports are outstanding to submit and present their reports on all these three legal instruments. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, as we conclude this latest session of the commission held virtually, we note with some relief that the end of the year is very near. It is an understatement to say that 2020 has been a very difficult year for many people across the continent and indeed the world over. It has been the worst of times and the worst of times. It has been a year with only one season, a winter of despair. According to one account, I quote, 2020 has seen the evils of COVID-19, authoritarian consolidation, corruption, inequality, and poverty as significant threat multipliers for human rights violations in Africa, end of quote. Indeed, some of the major human rights issues highlighted during this 67th ordinary session, including the loss of employment and livelihoods by millions of people, the descent of tens of millions into extreme poverty, the threat of starvation facing many others, the rise in armed conflicts and political crises nearly in all regions of the continent, the increase to epidemic proportions of the scourge of sexual and gender-based violence, the worsening of arbitrary deprivation of life and liberty by unlawful use of law enforcement pow powers of police and security forces show that 2020 has indeed been a year during which the state of human rights on our continent has gone from bad to worse. It has therefore been with a heavy heart that we heard during the public segment of this 67th session, some of the most gut-wrenching accounts of human rights violations from the statements presented under agenda item four on the situation of human rights in Africa. Fellow Africans, dear sisters and brothers, the past week saw the start of the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. Add the statements from the representatives of states parties of Angola and Malawi, and the various statements of CISOs of the 67th organization illustrate, this year's 16 days of activism is made all the more pressing on account of the epidemic proportions that sexual and gender-based violations have reached in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic giving rise to what I call SGBV-demic. This development has highlighted that the pervasiveness of, highlighted the pervasiveness of the scourge of se sexual and gender-based violence in all our societies. SGBV-demic is indicative that states parties and indeed all of us are failing women and girls. COVID-19 has shown that treating 
sexual and gender-based violence as any other crisis doesn't work. If anything, treating it as any other crisis is what led the situation to escalate to epidemic proportions. There is an imperative for states parties to declare a state of emergency to end the scourge of SGBV demic. Continuing with the business as usual approach to SGBV represents a betrayal of the commitments made under the Maputo protocol, denying women and girls that they deserve and they are entitled to a life free from SGBV or any other form of violence. It is therefore a human rights imperative that during the ongoing 16 days of activism, we campaign for and call on all states to declare a state of emergency and mobilize as a matter of urgency, all their governance, social and cultural, as well as financial resources to end SGBV demic. Today also marks the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. At our consideration during this session of the situation of vulnerable groups, notably older persons and persons with disabilities show, it is in times of crisis, such as the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, that the magnitude of the precariousness of the protection afforded to persons with disabilities becomes stark, at times with very dire consequences to their well-being and life. In planning for and responding to such crises, addressing the specific contexts and needs of the most vulnerable in our societies, such as persons with disabilities and older persons, is a defining feature and must be such a feature of an inclusive and just society. All policies, both in normal times and most importantly in times of crisis, should take account of the protection needs of vulnerable members of society, such as persons with disabilities to ensure that existing inequalities afflicting them are not exacerbated further. Addressing the needs of such members of societies is not merely a legal and moral necessity. It is also a, cri a critical factor for success in policy design and implementation. Our deliberation on the AU theme of the year on silencing the guns by 2020 and the various statements received on conflict situations show an alarming deterioration of the security situation in almost all parts of our continent. Instead of being silenced, the sound of guns seems to have become louder, both in countries with existing situations of violence and those in which new conflicts broke out. It, it emerges from the situations in the Sahel, Horn of Africa, Northern Mozambique, in Libya, in Cameroon, the lecture Baden region, that this deteriorating security situation has very grave consequences to the physical security and social and economic well being of affected po populations. The brutal attacks on a school in Cameroon on 24 October show civilians, including children, end up bearing the brunt of conflicts. I reiterate the grief concern expressed during the course of this session regarding the conflicts and crisis situations that rage in parts of Burkina Faso, Central African Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Libya, Nigeria, Somalia, South Sudan, Mali, Cameroon, among others. As we express our grave concern about the human rights consequences of the armed conflict in Ethiopia, as illustrated by the brutal killing of some 600 people in my cadre, our commission is horrified and saddened by the report of the massacre of at least 110 civilians in Nigeria earlier this week and the killing of at least 34 people in attack by gunmen on a bus in Western Ethiopia. We express our condolences and solidarity with the bereaved families and condemning these atrocious acts of mass killings in the strongest terms possible and urge the countries concerned to ensure that independent investigations are carried out and the institutional and political conditions for the security and protection of civilians are urgently put in place to end the recurrence of such acts of violence. We wish to remind all states of their primary responsibility 
for the security of their populations. And it is incumbent on them to seek and allow initiatives for resolving conflicts and conditions of insecurity by ensuring that the interests and rights of all sections of society are protected. We further call on the African Union to declare a decade for silencing the guns in Africa as a follow-up to the agenda of silencing the guns in Africa by 2020 in order to sustain the effort and the resources required for achieving this idea. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we also learned in the course of this 67th ordinary session about the alarming scale of people forcibly displaced from their homes and land. It is with alarm indeed that we note that in 2020, the continent is home to 29 million forcibly displaced persons, largely due to conflicts, but also as a result of environmental disasters and climate change. More than half a million women, children, and men are uprooted by violence in Cabo Delgado region of Mozambique. More than 45,000 people have fled into neighboring Sudan due to the armed conflict in the Tigray region of Ethiopia during the months of November only. These are but some of the examples of recent displacements. This staggering number of people forcibly displaced on our continent should make us all pause and despair and feel outraged. How is it that in 2020, as in the 1990s, we have the conditions forcing millions of our people, including women and children, into a drifting life as refugees and internally displaced persons, deprived of their means of livelihood, human dignity, and hope? How can this be possible unless states are failing to shoulder their responsibilities? How can this be possible unless those interested with managing the affairs of our societies are betraying the trust of the public in pursuit of their own narrow nation, narrow self-interest, thereby perpetuating the vicious cycles of misgovernance, misgovernance and authoritarian rule? It can't be that we continue to have millions of our brothers, sisters, and children forcibly displaced in states with even the most basic attributes of statehood, in societies with responsible leadership, in a continent with effectively functioning institutions. This is not normal. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in the course of this year, 35 declarations of states of emergency, national health emergency or national disaster were made in at least 28 countries on the African continent in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Of these, only 15 have since been lifted, while some of the states of emergency or disaster will expire later this month, others will remain in place longer, such as the states of emergency in Chad and Sierra Leone, which will only come to an end in March 2021. The Commission requests countries where states of emergency and particularly curfews, lockdowns, and heavy penalties for violations remain in, in place to review these measures in order to affirm whether these measures are necessary and in compliance with the requirements of the African Charter. As observed during this pandemic, the use of excessive force by police and other law enforcement institutions has become a major source of violations of human rights. It was during this session that our commission learned about the death of at least 45 people in Uganda, due mainly to excessive use of force by police in the course of trying to enforce COVID-19 regulations against protesters. This highly securitized, even militarized approach to compliance with COVID-19 state of emergency measures, resulting in arbitrary deprivation of life and liberties has been deplored by the commission on numerous occasions. In this regard, and following our recommendation in Resolution 449, we commend the ongoing efforts of South Africa to amend its laws related to the use of force by the police and calls on the government of South Africa to ensure that these amendments 
are in line with the human rights standards of the African Charter, including the principles of necessity and use of force only as last resort measure for averting threat to life or bodily integrity. Proportional, the principles of proportionality, precaution, and accountability. Excellencies, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, this commission was informed in the course of this session that the continent continues to lose enormous amount of financial resources to illicit financial flows to the tune of 89 billion US dollars, which is projected to increase if the phenomena of illicit financial flows is not curbed. This scourge of illicit financial flows for which the extractive industry sector is the leading culprit, is creating a gaping hole from the already enormous deficit for financing the development needs of the continent. Addressing this challenge has been made all the more pressing in the face of the 154 billion US dollars required to recover from the adverse socioeconomic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. Ending IFF through, among others, the effective regulation of the extractive industry sector is and has become a human rights and development necessity for Africa. Failure in this respect is to condone the masses of our people to live a life deprived of access to basic social services necessary for their socioeconomic well being and human dignity. This constitutes an abdication of responsibility by states parties for fulfilling their socioeconomic rights under the African Charter. Continuing to tolerate this state of affairs shouldn't be and can't be an option. We of course note that IFF is also a product of the international economic situation and everything must be done to address the conditions of the, glo the global economic system that facilitate the perpetuation of illicit financial flows that is bleeding the continent. We need to move away from the current neoliberal economic development model in order to ensure that the development needs of our societies are fully secure and guaranteed. The solution lies in a responsible system of government that pursues and implements a model of economic development that ever increasingly removes conditions of socioeconomic deprivations afflicting the masses of our people. The pervasive institutional and social fragilities that COVID-19 laid bare and create resilient societies that are best placed to wither existing and emerging health and climatic threats. A shift will also require a review of the current global socioeconomic order. The inequities in the global economic relations is best captured by the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres in his 2020 Nelson Mandela lecture, during which he observed that economies that were colonized are at greater risk of getting locked into the production of raw material, materials and low tech goods, a new form of colonialism, end of quote. The Commission is also deeply concerned by the human rights impact of climate change, which remains one of the most pressing challenges of our time. In many parts of the continent, severe weather conditions caused by climate change are already being felt. The cyclones that hit his eastern and southern African coast, the flooding that affected millions of people in East Africa, Central and West Africa regions, the locust invasion in East and Horn of Africa, the drought witnessed in Southern Africa, all attest that the climate emergency posing, poses existential threat to the millions of people across the continent. It is thus incumbent on states individually and collectively to assume full responsibility for adopting the necessary measures for protecting their peoples and economics from the climate change emergency that is worsening from one year to the other. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as the world seeks to end the threat of COVID-19 pandemic through a vaccine, I wish to join the call of the Arab Republic of Egypt that it made in the course of this session to ensure that efforts to immunize populations once a vaccine is 
found doesn't leave Africa behind. The Commission is in complete agreement that protecting the lives and health of people in Africa must receive equal priority with those of people elsewhere. In this regard, I reiterate the appeal of our Commission to the African Union to lead the call for, the, for creating the conditions, including for the waiver of relevant trade rules governing intellectual property rights so that COVID-19 prevention and treatment medical products and vaccine in particular can be produced on the continent generically and more easily made accessible by all people on our continent. In addition, we can't continue to, neg to neglect racism and racial oppression as one of the core challenges of the current global order. This discrimination experience, the discrimination experienced by the South African athlete Caster Semenya on the basis of sex, race, and gender, as highlighted by the South African Human Rights Commission in the course of this session, is one such manifestation of the continuing pervasiveness of the scourge of racism that affects people, including women, on our continent and beyond. We express our solidarity with Caster Semenya and her struggle for being treated fairly and justly. Your Excellencies, brothers and sisters, the Commission remains concerned by the governance deficit experienced in varying degrees across the continent, as expressed through corruption, attacks on media, human rights defenders, and civil society organizations, along with the, sh the shrinking civic space. Cases of intimidation and reprisals experienced by human rights defenders, civil society, opposition politicians, and journalists in countries across the continent range from defamation, stigmatization, harassment, and intimidation to travel bans, arbitrary arrest, and detention. The Commission expresses its deep concern about the acts of reprisals against some civil society organizations and participants of the NSARS protests in Nigeria, and about the arrest of members of the Initiative for Personal Rights of Egypt. It is the view of this commission that freedom of expression and association and an open and democratic participation in the public space are crucial to the achievement of good governance, inclusive societies, for achieving vibrant and resilient systems of governance, for sustainable development of countries, and are therefore at the heart of the prosperity peace and security of our continent. The Commission is also deeply concerned by the violence that accompanied electoral disputes in some of our countries, including Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea, and Tanzania, as highlighted in my opening statement. Before the end of the year, a number of countries, including those experiencing conflict, such as Somalia, the Central African Republic, Cameroon, and others, such as Uganda and Ghana, are heading for elections. The Commission emphasizes the supreme importance of elections as a mechanism for expressing the sovereign will of people. In this respect, I call on all these states' parties to ensure that there is an even playing field for all political parties and candidates, to refrain from acts of intimidation and violence, to guarantee that the electorate casts their votes freely without any interference. In relation to the regional elections expected to be held in Cameroon, we reiterate that the elections are held with the participation of all opposition parties and in conditions that doesn't lead to the disenfranchisement of the electorate in conflict-affected areas. Excellencies, fellow Africans, sisters and brothers. In my opening statement at the beginning of this session, I expressed concern about the digital divide in terms of which some people enjoy access to the internet with all the opportunities it presents for enjoying many human rights and, uh, and others, the majority of whom are deprived of this access. I echo UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres observation that the digital revolution and artificial intelligence will change the nature of work and the relationship between work, leisure and other activities, some of which we can't even imagine today. As the webinar that was convened on the sidelines of this session on protecting human rights in the context of the technological revolution, including artificial intelligence highlighted, there is a need for Africa to initiate 
collective measures, both for harnessing the opportunities that new technologies bring for the enjoyment of human and people's rights, and for mitigating the perils that technological developments pose for people on our continent. I wish at this point to underscore the importance of active participation by African states and Africans in the development of international policies and governance frameworks on artificial intelligence, robotics, and other new and emerging technologies. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's with regret that I report that the Commission didn't consider and finalize any communication at the merit stage of the communications procedure through which complaints lodged with the Commission on alleged human rights violations attributable to states are adjudicated. I sincerely apologize to citizens and institutions that are awaiting with patience the finalization of their communications for a long time. In recognition, however, of the need for addressing this institutional problem, the Commission in its 2021-2025 strategic plan, which it considered and adopted during this session, have identified strengthening the protection mandate of the Commission at its, as its first strategic priority area. With the effective implementation of this strategic plan, the Commission hopes to avoid a situation in which it fails to consider and finalize merit communications. The adoption of the strategic plan 2021-2025 by the Commission is an important milestone that positions the Commission not only to address existing human rights issues and institutional challenges, but also to effectively address emerging and new human rights issues on our continent. I wish at this point to thank my colleagues, members of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights for their hard work to have this strategic plan adopted. Most notably, the working group on specific issues of the Commission and all those who helped with the development of the strategic plan. I wish to in particular thank the GIAID for its technical support that facilitated the development of the strategic plan and Algeria and South Africa for their submission of inputs that enriched the strategic plan. I wish to express my appreciation to the national human rights institutions, which contributed to the strategic plan and participated in this session, and wish to reaffirm the important role that they continue to play as a link between the regional human rights system and human rights protection and promotion on the ground in our state's parties. I also wish to honor and thank human rights defenders, members of civil society organizations, journalists, and the media who put their lives and freedom on the line every day to work for a world in which all people enjoy their human rights and live in dignity. To all of you, the participants in our session, I wish to thank you for your engagement and essential contribution to the work of the Commission. It is our hope that by the time next year that we convene our 68th organization, that we will be able to welcome all of you once again, hopefully in person. Finally, I wish to, uh, to extend my appreciation to everyone who, who worked hard once again for the convening and effective conduct of this virtual session of the Commission. It would be remiss on, of me if I do not acknowledge with deep gratitude the great collaboration and hard work of my colleagues, honorable members of the Commission. Thank you very much for your hard work and support, often doing so beyond a duty of court. I can't thank you enough for that. I also wish to thank my colleagues, staff of the Secretariat, who bear the brunt of the demanding workload of the work of this commission. You are the heroes and heroines of our work. Thank you so much. To all of you, I thank you for your kind attention. 
And we at the African Commission continue to count on your support for us to push forward the noble cause of human and people's rights, our collective responsibility on our continent. I thank you once again. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson, for your closing statement. It is now my singular honor to invite Dr. Habele Matlosa, Director of the Department of Political Affairs of the African Union Commission, to deliver the closing statement on behalf of His Excellency Musa Faki Mahamat, Chairperson of the African Union Commission, and to declare the 67th Ordinary Session of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights officially closed. Dr. Matlosa, you have the floor, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, moderator uh, of this uh, important uh, uh, closing ceremony of the 67th session of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. It's my pleasure to join you in this uh, uh, tail end of your session, uh, which I gather has been very uh, fruitful and productive. I listened carefully to the uh, uh, summary of the outcomes, as well as the other statements made by uh, the uh, distinguished uh, panelists on this uh, closing session. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to represent uh, the chairperson of the African Union Commission, uh, who unfortunately is unable to uh, join in person, uh, but I hope I'll be in a position to transmit his um, uh, 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 vote of thanks and uh, some words of gratitude uh, for the successful convening of this uh, important session. Uh, let me kick it off by uh, uh, extending uh, his uh, gratitude uh, first to the chairperson of the commission, uh, uh, His Excellency uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Solomon Derso, uh, uh, the commissioners, uh, uh, you know, joining hands uh, with him in this important uh, task of our union of inculcating a culture of human rights. We really appreciate uh, your efforts greatly. Uh, probably words are not adequate to express our uh, you know, profound gratitude. I would like to transmit that on behalf of the chair. And also the same goes to uh, the secretariat. Uh, we salute the secretariat under the stewardship of uh, the acting uh, executive secretary and the deputy and the entire team for the job well done. We really appreciate uh, your sterling uh, effort uh, in, 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 in ensuring the successful convening of the 67th session of our commission in Banjul. I would like to salute uh, our honorable ministers who are on this platform uh, uh, and our distinguished ambassadors, members of the PRC who have joined on this session and uh, all the other uh, participants, uh, uh, members of the, of, the, of the national human rights institutions, uh, uh, civil society organizations, NGOs, and uh, our uh, in, in, uh, development partners, who are also probably with us. I would like to really express our gratitude from the commission, from the African Union Commission, on behalf of the chair of the commission and on behalf of the commissioner for political affairs, uh, uh, who is also unable to, to join us. I'm, I'm therefore transmitting these messages on their behalf. And, and chair, uh, uh, moderator, not to forget uh, my colleagues from the commission, uh, who probably are also on this platform, to thank them for working hand in glove with the secretariat uh, to, to, to ensure the successful convening of this 67th session of our Banjul Commission. And uh, uh, moderator, allow me also to really, uh, 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 in, 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 in probably in a special way, to also thank the interpreters a great deal. Thank the interpreters for allowing us to have a conversation, ensuring that we understand each other, and we talk uh, to each other, not, not, not over, over each other. Uh, so that we have a, a productive discussion as, uh, as indicated clearly in the outcome statement. As I now transmit uh, this message on behalf of the chair of 
the commission, I would like to, on his behalf, moderator and the chair of the Banjul Commission, Professor uh, 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 Derso, I would like to transmit to you from him five key messages that he considers important and strategic for the commission to ponder over. And fortunately, listening to all the statements that have been made so far in this closing ceremony, uh, I, 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 I was happy to hear some of this being reflected upon, and hopefully they will form part of your action plan going forward. Number one, the chair is alive to the fact that you are holding this six, seventh session under very, very trying circumstances of COVID-19 that has, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 ravaged that has ravaged not only Africa, but the entire world. And salute you therefore for convening it in this uh, new way through a uh, virtual means. This is what they, they, you know, some, some call the, 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 the new normal, or you can even call it the abnormal normal, basically. So this abnormal normal, we need to start getting used to it. And we appreciate that the commission has taken the bull by the horns. The chair appreciates that. But the chair also uh, uh, joins you in, in imploring, in imploring member states of the African Union to ensure that restrictions that have been imposed as a result of COVID-19 are temporary restrictions. Curfews, lockdowns, states of emergencies, states of disasters are temporary measures, not permanent state of affairs. Because we have noticed the extent to which human and people's rights have been you know, restricted and clamped down upon during this period. Therefore, we, the, the chair is making a clarion call to the member states and implores the commission to ensure that a member states treat this condition as temporary and ephemeral, not permanent and long-term. So that's what the chair is saying. And as to the, 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 the chairperson of the commission said, clarion call also that we should stem out this uh, tradition or, or, or culture of sexual and gender-based violence. That is also uh, you know, uh, on, on the increase during this COVID-19. So he implores member states to ensure that these restrictions are, are, are temporary and also will clamp down uh, 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 sexual and gender-based violence. That's message number one that the chair is transmitting to your uh, you know, August gathering today. Message number two of strategic importance to a uh, uh, moderator and chair of the commission is in relation to the theme of the year of 2020. The theme for this year, and we're at the tail end of the year, as we're all aware, is silencing the guns, creating conducive conditions for Africa's development. A very important theme that has serious ramifications for human and people's rights on our continent. And the chair of the commission, uh, uh, Dr. Derso, has reminded us of the raging violent conflicts on the continent that also have serious implications for the respect and protection of human and people's rights. Therefore, it is important for us to join hands and ensure that this year, the, the theme for this year bears fruit. We are at the tail end of the year, we are aware, but I think it is never late to try something good and positive. Let's remember that uh, actually on the uh, 6th of December, which is like next week, if I'm not, uh, if, if I'm correct, uh, uh, moderator, uh, very soon, uh, there's going to be an extraordinary summit of the union on this theme, silencing the guns. So it is important that the commission finds a way of making a contribution to that debate that's going to be conducted under the leadership of the chair of the union, uh, President uh, uh, Madame Cyril Ramaphosa of South Africa. It's important that human rights issues are also tabled in a strong way 
in the communique or declaration that's going to be adopted, which is going to be called the Johannesburg Declaration. It is important that human rights issues uh, are, are at the front and center of that document. That's uh, uh, message number uh, uh, two. Message number three, uh, moderator, uh, rotates around the African continental free trade area. A very important initiative of our union. And as we all are aware, uh, it's going to open up uh, 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 all, 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 all you know, important vistas for Africa's uh, autonomous socioeconomic development that uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Derso was referring to when he said Africa needs a new model of development, a socioeconomic model that centers, that, 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 that puts at the center the rights of its citizens, not markets, but, but more people. So people-centered development. So we hope the African CFTA, the, the CFTA will ensure that this new development model comes into effect. And the, we commence trade, we commence the African trade uh, on the 1st of January, 2021. It's an important uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 date that we should not forget. And let's also remember that on the 5th of December, also, right? On the 5th of December, uh, there is going to be an extraordinary summit of our union focusing on AFCF AFCFTA. Again, there's going to be a declaration, Johannesburg Declaration on AFCFTA that should, in fact, be, uh, uh, we should be mindful that that declaration also, uh, 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 you know, mainstreams in a big way human and people's rights. Because there's no way that, 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 that free trade will succeed without bringing people at the center and their rights being respected and protected all times. That's the third message, uh, uh, moderator and chair. The fourth message, which is linked to uh, the, the, the ones above that I've just already uh, transmitted from the chair, revolves around the free movement of persons and the African passport. Free movement of persons and the African passport. And let's remember, let's remember that silencing the gun AFCFTA and free movement of persons in the African passport are all of them, the three of them, flagship projects of Agenda 2063. And in all the three, there's no way we can succeed as the continent if we don't mainstream strongly human and people's rights. So uh, as we silence the guns and as we you know, I, I roll out the AFCFTA on the, on the 1st of January, 2021, let's also be mindful that free movement of persons is facilitated across the continent in, at three, at, at, in, three, in three stages. First, we need to, uh, member states of the African Union have to allow a right of entry into their borders by African citizens, legitimately you know, uh, 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 legitimately moving across uh, the, the continent. Two, stage two, right of residence. Uh, once citizens have been allowed to enter our, 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 our territories, our borders, there has to be a legal way of allowing them to, in, to, 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 to reside in a legal manner, not illegal, in a legal manner. Three, once they have entered, they have now uh, found a legal legal means of residence, they also need to be allowed uh, 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 the right of establishment to, to, in terms of business opportunities. So this is what the, the African uh, pro the protocol, this is what the protocol uh, to the treaty, to the African economic, treaty on African economic community uh, 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 relating to free movement of persons, right of residence and right of, right of establishment is all about. And at the present moment, unfortunately, the, the protocol has been signed only by 33 member states. We need all the 55 to ratify, to sign and ratify the, the protocol. It has only been ratified by four, Rwanda, uh, Niger, Mali, South Oman principle. We need 15 ratification for the protocol to come into force. So we call on the Banjul Commission also to take up this 
uh, 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 responsibility together with the commission, with the, with the African Union Commission, because this is also an advancement of the, uh, the 1981 African Charter on Human and People's Rights uh, in terms of uh, writing, you know, you know uh, uh, protecting the right of people to move freely on the continent, because our continent certainly is closed to its citizens while wide open to other citizens from elsewhere, Europe, America, Japan, China, all of them, but closed, closed, totally closed to its own citizens. We need to correct that historical mistake. The fifth and final message, moderator and chair of the Banjul Commission, revolves around the theme, the AU theme for 2021, next year, which is like in a month or in a month's time from now. That theme is very important for the for the commission also. The chair would like to, you know, uh, 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 plead with the commission that they should also take that theme seriously. The theme is on arts and culture, the heritage for Africa, for the heritage for the Africa we want, arts and culture, the heritage for the Africa we want. This is an important theme, and uh, the. Banjul Commission, the Commission on Human and People's Rights, based in Banjul, is therefore invited to work with all other organs of the Union and under the coordination of the African Union Commission in Addis Ababa to come to the party and make sure that we also successfully implement uh, this theme for 2021. And there could be a way in which the Commission could consider how we can entrench successfully within member states, through regional communities, at, at the continental level, and working with our international partners across the world to ensure how we inculcate a culture of democracy. Oh, sorry, a culture of human rights. Sorry, moderator. A culture of human rights on the continent through the work that the commission is doing and has been doing all the years that we, we really commend you for, 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 for continuing to, 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 to push forward. These are the five messages, uh, 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 moderator, I wanted to uh, you know, uh, transmit on behalf of the chair of the commission, uh, uh, His Excellency uh, Musafaki uh, Mahamat, uh, uh, who un unfortunately was unable to, to be with you. And on his behalf, and on behalf of the commissioner, Corporate Lafaz, it's now my pleasure and honor, uh, moderator and the chair of, of the commission, to now officially uh, to, to, to officially declare this sixth, seventh session of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights officially closed. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Matlosa, for your statement and for bringing us the messages from His Excellency Musa Faki Mahamat, Chairperson of the African Union Commission, and uh, for declaring the session closed. Thank you, sir. This brings us to the end of the closing ceremony of the 67th Ordinary Session of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. Thank you all for honoring our invitation, and we hope to meet again at the next Ordinary Session of the Commission. Members of the media are kindly reminded that there will be a virtual press conference at 12.30 hours GMT. The media advisory note is on our website at www.achpr.org. Thank you, everyone. Shukran Jazeera, Merci beaucoup, Obrigada, Asante Sana, and from the Gambia, Jerejef. Thank you.